born in Mexico City and raised in Cologne. I'm originally from Colombia. I originally come from Belgium. I originally come from India. And I come from Mexico. I'm originally from Jena in Germany. All the colleagues at Forschungszentrum Jülich are working very inspired and motivated. And I don't mean only the researchers. Regardless of institute, everyone creates a common working culture, which I enjoy a lot. Uh, I decided to work at Forschungszentrum Jülich because it provides a unique combination of research expertise, uh, computational resources, as well as a good work-life balance. I enjoy my research because of its interdisciplinary nature. The potential it has to improve our quality of life and the challenges it brings, especially because we cannot easily translate what we do in the lab into the society or industry. So what I find most intriguing about uh, stratospheric research is that you have to um, measure tiny amounts of trace gases uh, and you have to do it very precisely. In addition, the stratosphere is a very harsh environment it's very hard to get to, and the concentrations there are even lower, while at the same time, it's a very important place for global climate. Our research can contribute to a better understanding and therefore prevention and diagnostic of major diseases that impact the society. Not only neurological disease like Alzheimer's disease, but also psychiatric disease like schizophrenia and depression. I love the biosensors field since it is multidisciplinary, covering different areas that go from biology, chemistry, physics to engineering. Actually, I decided to come to Jülich because uh, IEK7 is one of the best places in the world to do stratospheric research. One day I wanted to become one of those scientists researching in Germany. Even I didn't know at the time probably where Germany was located. I'm excited to work in this research area because there are many open questions with the potential to have a big social impact. Yeah, hello and herzlich willkommen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Right, thank you. Thank hello you and uh, welcome. Um, thank you for coming. I'm glad that you're all here in the LVR Museum in Bonn. I also like to welcome the spectators in the live stream who have joined us uh, online um, for this uh, special lecture evening, the end of the year. Um, Lecture evening of the Forst and Jülich. My name is Johannes Döbelt. I'm a freelance a journalist and a presenter working for the WDR at Deutschlandfunk, and I'm pleased to be your host tonight. Young um, researchers uh, will show us today what they can do and what they're working on at the Forschel Center in Munich. We have three really exciting presentations for you tonight um, on very topical issues. On the one end, uh, AI, artificial intelligence, climate and the quality of our air, and um, how uh, we can combat one of the most dangerous infectious diseases on our planet by using modern state-of-the-art technology. You'll notice that I and we uh, will switch between languages, between German and English. Sometimes we'll speak German, sometimes English, simply due to the fact that all the presentations will be in English tonight. Uh, for those of you who uh, would like to listen to the translation, you've received a headset at the reception. You can choose between Channel 1 and 2, depending on whether you want to listen in German or in English. And for you at home in the live stream, you can also pick and choose uh, by clicking on the headset symbol in your new player. You can click between the two languages there as well. And now I'm pleased uh, to announce the host for tonight, which is the chairman of the board of directors of the Forschungszentrum Jülich, Professor Wolfgang, Wolfgang Marquardt. Good evening, Mr. Debit. Uh, Mr. Markman, last year uh, we had uh, the lecture recorded without any audience, and today uh, we have a face to face presentation. I think 160 guests are here face to face, of course, under very strict uh, hygiene rules. Uh, how happy are you that this is possible? I think it's great that we can meet face to face here, and as we know, um, even if you have to uh, take into consideration certain conditions that restrict us, and because some some didn't come for that reason, but I'm very pleased that uh, uh, we can also talk uh, face to face uh, during this uh, evening of the research center. Uh, on similar events. Um, 
Uh, the very important people, professors and directors of institutes, uh, come and say say something in their presentations and the report. But today it's the younger researchers who are here. Why is it important to give them a voice? Uh, research lives and thrives on new ideas and new impetus, and they usually come in particular uh, from young colleagues. And uh, quite deliberately, we chose a different format, different from the last, past few years, to emphasize that point. And uh, for all of us, you have a few words of welcome that you prepared. So you have the floor, Professor Wolfgang Marquardt. Thank you, Mr. Dibbert. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this year's um, evening of lectures of the Research Center in Munich. Secretaries of State, dear Mr. Rachel, dear Mr. Gunnewig, uh, dear members, dear uh, Chairman of the Supervisory Board of the Research Center, dear Mr. Rieke, dear Mr. Stosbeck, dear Mr. Altringer, dear speakers of tonight, and uh, dear colleagues. Dear guests, here in the LVR Museum in Bonn, and wherever you might uh, listen to us and watch us uh, on the live, in the live stream, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to welcome you here tonight on behalf of the Entire Board of Directors of the Forschung Centrum to this uh, evening of lectures 2021. As always, um, the, uh, this uh, event at the end of the year is to give you some insights informative and an entertaining in unsere, uh, insight Arbeit. into our research activities. We heard already the Jülich lectures could only be presented in a digital format. I'm happy that today we have been able to choose a hybrid format so we can meet face to face here in the hall and at the same time it's also possible to join us online via a live stream. I'd like to thank all of you that you are observing the 2G and the 2G plus rules, i.e. either recovered um, or vaccinated, and um, that uh, you can enjoy this wonderful atmosphere in the museum. At this point, I'd also like to thank uh, Mr. Altringer very much indeed, uh, the landlord and the deputy director of the LVR Landless Museum, to thank him for the hospitality and the possibility he's given us to come back here and um, to use uh, the uh, festive um, venue um, for our event. Dear Mr. Altringer, we also look forward to your comments on the museum and the exhibitions and the guided tours uh, in which we can participate later on. And I'm particularly also pleased tonight uh, to welcome my two colleagues on the board uh, Melchior Lamprecht and Professor Astrid Lamprecht uh, and um, uh, to uh, present them to you. Uh, this year they joined the board of directors and uh, they've um, in which the board director is Ms. Rita since April this year. She's in charge of Section 3, uh, Life Sciences, where neurosciences and biological information processing and bioeconomics are located. Professor Lamprecht um, joined us in June um, and took over Section 1. Physics and uh, the Peter Greenberg Institute and uh, supercomputing, the supercomputing center, material characterization and uh, electroniza uh, electrons and neutrons. Um, events like today um, also remind us very painfully of the loss of our esteemed colleague on the board of directors, Professor Harald Bolt who died this year after a serious illness. Harald Bolt, um, um, over many years, uh, played a major role in the research center and also played a major role in developing its strategy. Events like tonight uh, were particularly important to him because it was a particular concern to him uh, to carry the research uh, done by the Institute uh, outside to the outside world and uh, to the outside the research institutions into two towards society. In days like today, we miss him very much indeed. 
This year's um, evening of lectures uh, is, has the motto, Young uh, Insights Impact, uh, that uh, describes our program uh, today, but also our mission and our self-image. With uh, research and innovation, we want to make uh, effective contributions to coping with uh, challenges that are relevant for society. Excellent research. Uh, that uh, has an impact on society and that thrives on new ideas, new impetus, uh, new approaches, uh, new um, creative uh, researchers who, with their research, we really want to make a difference. Six such uh, researchers we'll introduce to you today on this evening and uh, we'll give you an insight into three exciting fields of research that we that, and the six uh, young colleagues are working on in Europe. Now, these colleagues, uh, you will see them today, um, and they're not only representative of ambitious and youth-inspired research that we carry out in Munich, but they also stand for diversity, diversity that we think is an enhancer of creativity and innovation. Um, first, uh, perspectives from various angles, looking at the same thing, the same method, the same questions and updates at the end of the day, lead to the uh, multidimensional um, solution space in which uh, research is carried out to find answers to complex problems. I therefore, I'm very pleased uh, that together with you, we can listen to the three tandem presentations of tonight. But before that, I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Volker Rieke, um, the chairman of our supervisory board, for a word of welcome. Mr. Rieke. Dear Professor Marquardt, um, dear members of the Board of Directors, Mr. Professor Melchior, Mr. Lambrecht, Mr. Benecke, um, dear Under Secretaries and uh, dear um, employees of the Research Center of Jülich, and uh, Dear as the host of today, we're very pleased to be your guests. Dear guests, scientific topics and the fields of work of the Research Center in Jülich are manifold. I just recently noticed that during the supervisable meeting that we held. On the one hand, um, we could look back at a very successful year, and, um, and this is uh, the noble task of the supervisor. We always we also were able to look into the future to see what's being initiated or will be triggered and what will be newly um, kicked off. And uh, that is more than impressive, as I told the board of directors. It's dynamic. I'd like to use this opportunity to thank the board of directors and also all those who are present here and all those who are um, watchers on the screen. So all the staff, all the employees of the Research Center. I'd like to thank you very much indeed for all your efforts. I'd like to thank you specifically for the outstanding performance uh, um, of the Research Center in Munich. And today's uh, evening is also a reflection of this impressive breadth of topics. It's uh, an expression of the depth of research, the excellence of research carried out in Munich. And we'll see that also when we listen to the presentations in a moment. It also becomes clear, and it's very important nowadays, that uh, science provides very tangible solutions to um, challenges that uh, society is faced with. And that needs to be emphasized. We need to think about that as well. In at times when public budgets are under the pressure of justifi justifying public funds, either because of uh, public debt or uh, because of uh, recent crises um, that has um, also had an impact on the allocation of public funds. The many contributions of the uh, Ulrich 
äh, Vorschuss hätte in die Rheinisches Revier. Our next and example, what I mean, um, here the topic of transfer and valuation um, is uh, always taken into account. Uh, overall, the Forschungs and EU is well positioned, there's an innovation strategy, but it's important, it's also important for me to emphasize that the researchers themselves take this to heart, and I put an exclamation mark behind that. So please, we need a new innovation culture that shows courage, uh, that is innovation-oriented and uh, application-oriented, so that uh, the well-being in our country can be secured in future generations, and uh, so that we can make concrete uh, contributions to solutions in the future as well. I'm very pleased that uh, this uh, evening of lectures, as Mr. Marquardt said, has uh, thought about a new form together with the Portuguese, but that young researchers are in the focus and their success stories are put in the foreground because promoting scientific young scientists and young researchers is one, if not the most important concern of the Federal Ministry of Research and Education. Um, um, junior scientists during the scientific qualification make major contributions to scientific and gains the knowledge in society and la lastly also to innovation. At the same time, qualification is also a prerequisite to covering the future need for highly qualified jobs and staff in um, the modern society of knowledge. But, and that's also important to emphasize, uh, junior researchers also need attractive conditions to work in. Um, for uh, post-doctors, uh, uh, the quota have been reduced, but uh, it's still time, therefore, our ministry very much uh, supports good working conditions in science, in research. We want to make sure that the uh, share of uh, fixed-term uh, contracts uh, for um, post-docs uh, will decrease. We want to strengthen teaching and science, and with the excellent strategy, together with the federal state governments, uh, we are set uh, important incentives to create uh, permanent jobs in uh, research and innovation. Um, and gives um, uh, a, a unique uh, planning reliability. And with these uh, agreements, uh, the, our ministry has a clear expectation that more permanent jobs will be created for junior researchers. The addition in terms of planability and for university research institutions must be uh, reflected in an in addition uh, in planability and predictability for uh, the employees. And therefore, the amendment uh, of the year 2016 of um, uh, the fixed term contracts are is, is assessed. Results will be available in early 2022 to see to what extent um, uh, that legislation needs to be further developed during the new legislative period. And so this is a, a a prospect into the future. And now, coming from the young people, the young uh, reserve to move to the old things, place that we're at today, and that uh, is the, the venue of our history, I'm very pleased that this um, uh, event has returned to Bonn. I think I've been told it's a good tradition to me, it's been the first time, but it's a very nice venue, the Rheinisch and Landeswehr Museum. Be back here to have face-to-face -face meetings, as Mr. Marquardt said. I think uh, we can't um, to, uh, uh, connect the past and uh, looked into the future uh, by anything better than this historic site. And I'd like to thank the organizers of the meeting. I uh, look forward to the exciting presentation that have been announced and I wish all of us an inspiring and uh, pleasant evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rikus. Could you stay with us for a moment? Um, now I'd like to ask Mr. Marquardt to come back on stage for a moment as well, because Mr. Marquardt, you still have one particular duty to say thank you to somebody. Yes, indeed, uh, Mr. Derbert, um, ladies and gentlemen, before we move to the presentations, I'd like to use this opportunity to say thank you to, so to one person here in this hall, um, someone who for many years 
um, uh, did a lot um, for the Forschungszentrum Munich and is uh, supporting to the development uh, very effectively. Many large-scale projects were supported by her. Our deputy uh, chairperson of the supervisory board, Mrs. Stolzberg. Dear Mrs. Stolzberg. Dear Mr. Stolzberg, um, um, when uh, uh, you will soon retire and resign on that occasion, and on behalf of the entire board of directors, I'd like to thank you very much indeed for your uh, great commitment uh, for the Boston Center of and also for the uh, cooperation in a spirit of trust over the past few years. We've seen you always as a very committed supporter um, of our work uh, uh, in the Ministry of Culture and Education of the State of North Australia. You've always had an open ear for our concerns and interests. Without your cooperation and your support, uh, one of the other projects uh, could not have been implemented, certainly not the implementation of our new strategy, uh, not the way we've been finally eventually been able to do so. I think here of uh, the structural change projects, the Helms cluster for hydrogen research first and foremost, and also projects um, uh, in battery research and quantum computing. We would like to thank all you very much indeed, and uh, we'll combine that with our best wishes for the new part, uh, the new um, section in your life. And a few flowers. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Marquardt. You see me surprised and I feel I'm touched. Uh, it's been a great pleasure for me uh, to be on the supervisory board of the Forschungszentrum and to make my contribution. It's been a personal pleasure for me both uh, to be on the supervisory board. I think we've been able to cooperate quite well among colleagues, but also with the board of directors, as you mentioned. Um, every supervisory board meeting has to be prepared, and um, that's something that we jointly manage quite well. And uh, I'm, I'm happy, uh, and Dan, thank you, and I, I'm happy about your, your your praising words. But sometimes supervisory boards have to be a bit critical, and sometimes we were. But uh, at the end of the day, we've always come to a positive conclusion. And for me, it's been a great pleasure to be both on the supervisory board and to cooperate with the board of directors, and also to defend the interests of the state of North West Australia and uh, North Hemisphere as a, a research venue, which is a very strong venue here in this, uh, in this region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Storzberg. Thank you, Mr. Marquardt. Thank you, Mr. Rieke. Now comes the most important part of tonight, namely the speeches, the presentations. All the presentations will be delivered in English because that is the working language of the researchers and because everybody has an international research background. And I'd like to continue in English too. One of the world's most serious diseases and how it can be detected. Two young scientists have worked on malaria and on a new biosensor which can detect the disease much better than other existing methods. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm welcome to two researchers from the Institute of Biological Information Processing, to Dr. Gabriela Figueroa Miranda, she's postdoc in the group Molecular Bioelectronics, and as well to Dr. Viviana Rincon Montes. She's postdoc in the group Neuroelectronic Interfaces. <laughs> I've heard you two just uh, completed your doctoral degrees. Congratulations for that. Thank you. Thank you. And um, now you're both continuing your research on a project that will help to fight malaria. Um, Gabriela, of course, that's a huge task for two young, young scientists, and you 
already worked so much on this issue, on this research. What keeps you motivated? Uh, what motivates me, so first of all, because I love the research that I'm doing, I love the biosensors um, research, mm -hmm. and second of all, to know that with my research I can help other people, like detecting diseases, this is what really moves me. <laughs> Helping people, I think, is one of the best motivations I can imagine. Well, then I would say please listen very carefully to their presentation entitled Finger Prick with a Big Impact, a Biosensor for Malaria. Yes, this is the sound of a mosquito. Perhaps for many of you, this is annoying, especially during summer. However, for people living in tropical countries such as in Latin America, Africa, or India, this sound might indicate that you have been infected with malaria. Malaria is caused by the bite of a mosquito that transmits the plasmodium parasites. Actually, Malaria is one of the oldest diseases in the world, with cases dated back to the first millennium before Christ in Greece and China. And despite being known for so long, 229 million cases of malaria were reported in 2019. If we compare this to current numbers of COVID-19, we can clearly see that malaria is still a real threat. Now, if you suspect that you have been infected with COVID, Similar, if you suspect that you have been infected with malaria, the first step is to get a rapid diagnostic test. And of course, depending on the result, a specific treatment will be given. However, current rapid diagnostic tests fail to correctly identify malaria. First of all, they often provide false positives. Also, they do not provide a quantification of the parasitemia level. This means uh, how many parasites are there in your blood. And most importantly, these do not discriminate between the different parasites of malaria. And this future is of huge importance because depending on the malaria parasite, and a specific treatment must be given. Now, if we check the statistics, we can see that in malaria endemic countries, at least 5% of the treatments fail and in some cases, even 20%. And this is, of course, a serious issue, because on one side, we're having a high drug resistance problem, and on the other side, there is an important monetary loss, especially in Africa, where $12 billion domestic product loss are generated every year. Clearly, this can be prevented if we can overcome the weaknesses of this current malaria diagnostic test. And this is why I started working since 2015 in the development of a high-fidelity malaria biosensor, which was mainly developed during my doctoral research project. However, so far, it has been only tested at lab scale. That means with a big setup and malaria parasite in vitro cultures. Seeing the outstanding performance of this biosensor at the lab scale, I started thinking how to make this sensor really portable and useful for the humanity. And here is what I thought of Viviana, who I met for the first time in a DAD event in 2015, which took place in Bremen. And I remember her since she asked me a lot of questions regarding the presentation that I gave there uh, with the so-called title, Mechanical Minds. And I couldn't have imagined that I will, the destiny will bring us together again. I met her for the second time in Ulix Research Center, where we both worked together at the Bioelectronics IBI3 Institute under the nice supervision of Professor Offenhoisa. I realized that her background in electronics and microfabrication could complement with mine in biosensing and electrochemistry. So this perfect pairing of knowledge could help us to translate the big and bulky device towards the realization of our groundbreaking device. So currently, we are developing a smaller and portable demonstrator that can be easily transported to remote areas. It is intended to be a portable and user-friendly device detection test 
So you can picture it, similar to a glucose measuring device for diabetic patients. It is an electrochemical multi-target malaria biosensor. But do not worry, you don't understand all. I assure you that using it is way easier than its complicated name. So it will consist of a small electronic reader and a test strip. And the test strip is fabricated on a flexible polymer substrate, which has several electrodes. And apart from that, it has a low fabrication cost. So unlike the commercial diagnostic tests that use fragile antibodies, this detection technology uses novel and robust aptamer detection molecules. And aptamers are also very known as synthetic antibodies, since they are artificially selected in the lab. And they are single-strand DNA molecules, so that just like the antibodies bind with a strong affinity to a specific biomarker present in a biological sample, such as the proteins that the malaria parasites produces. So this binding event allows us to detect a signal that we can measure. In this case, in our sensor, we have immobilized four different aptamer molecules that can recognize different proteins from the malaria, different malaria parasites. Does this detection technology allow us to detect and discriminate between the different parasites present, present in a blood sample? And apart from that, we can also, apart from detecting the infecting parasite, we can also quantify the percentage of the parasitemia, so the amount of parasite present in the blood. We have validated that this detection technology in the lab with in vitro parasite cultures. And as you can see here in the, these four graphs, so we tested with the four different aptamer molecules. And what we observed, it was a high sensitivity for a low parasite concentration, even as lower as 50 parasites per microliter, with this surpassing the lowest detection limit that the commercial diagnostic test has, and also overcoming the required standards by the World Health Organization. So with this device, the patient can be treated with the right anti-malaria drug and the adequate dosage, eliminating the drug resistance problems and the previously mentioned high costs associated with such failing treatments. Apart from that, we are also implementing in our prototype the detection, the system that can allow us to transfer the data to the mobile phone. With this, given the possibility of epidemiological surveillance and treatment monitoring. So after these excellent results, we have realized that this base technology of this malaria biosensor can be actually translated for the detection of other diseases. Therefore, we have opened the possibility of having a spin-off so that we can offer this technology as a platform for the detection, either in vitro or in the future, in vivo, of not only infectious but also chronic diseases. As you've heard, we are now developing the first in vitro demonstrator. That means that we are currently looking for funding so that we can finish this demonstrator and, of course, so that we can develop many all other applications beyond malaria. So for example, for the detection of COVID-19 and other infectious respiratory diseases with similar symptoms, everything in just one chip. So as you can see, this technology will be essential not only for the detection of novel pathogens, but also as a preparation for future pandemics. It sounds good, right? Well, it's not all plain on research and technology transfer. It is not straightforward to go from the lab to the market. It will take us some time to reach a, a market-ready product. So starting from getting funding again, uh, we can bring you then a first 
in vitro demonstrator so that it can be ready to start a regulatory pathway. And this is important because we have to perform first clinical trials so that we can achieve and obtain the corresponding certifications. So yeah, there is still a long way to go, but it is, of course, an exciting way to go. So at the same time, we have been also encouraged by different NGOs, such as Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics, better known as FINE, which work together with the World Health Organization. And they have provided us a positive feedback about this biosensor and even possible help with the preclinical trials. So while the, while the way to go is still challenging, we are currently looking for economical stakeholders to support to grow our project idea and also for a partner that can complement our team with a business background. Support us and you will be supporting the transition from novel diagnostics from the lab to the society. Last but not least, I would, we would like to thank all the people that have been fundamental for the realization of this project. Thank you. Thank you, Viviana and Gabriela. Thank you very much. Thanks. Viviana, that actually sounds good, as you said. <laughs> um, but you talked a lot about money as well, about funding. So what's the big challenge there? Why is it so hard for you to get the funding? Yeah, well, as I said, it is still a long road, and then we need money not only to keep the development going on, mm -hmm. but to start with all these phases, regulatory pathway, demonstrator, and then after the demonstrator, the prototype, and all this consumes a lot of money and, of course, time. Yeah, that's the challenge. And we wish you all the best and that you Thank find you. some investors, maybe tonight. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Gabriela Figueroa Miranda and Viviana Rincon Montes. Climate change and extreme weather events like we've seen this year in Germany or at the moment in Canada are one of the biggest problems facing humanity right now. The research of the next two scientists can help us to understand more about weather, about climate and about the huge amount of data we can collect. The next presentation is on climate and earth system data, collecting data with weather balloons and understanding them with AI. Please welcome Dr. Scarlett Stadler. She's principal investigator of the project KISTE, which stands for AI Strategy for Earth System Data. And she's postdoc at the Institute of Advanced Simulation, Jülich Supercomputing Center. And welcome as well, Dr. Johannes Lauber. He's a group leader with the European Research Council starting grant, and he's working at the Institute of Energy and Climate Research. <music> Khaled and Johannes, last week the UN Climate Conference was concluded in Glasgow and climate change was given a lot of media attention, we all heard about it, but issues like climate and air pollution um, too are part of your everyday life, of your work life at least. How does this affect your personal life, I was wondering? So does it have any influence maybe on your personal contribution to reduce air pollution or to, well, yeah, to fight climate change, Johannes? Yes, so we do have regular family discussions on how to, for instance, reduce our CO2 footprint. And do you have an example where you already Well, we do, do try it? to fly less or not at all, if possible. That's a good start, I would say. What, what about you, Scarlett? I only eat vegan food to uh, avoid the industrial farming and uh, the de deforestation um, associated with it. Vegan food, yeah, that is a big impact as well, I think. So, now we're looking forward to the presentation. Scarlett Stadler and Johannes Laube. What motivates us to understand the Earth and climate systems? Well, we want to be certain about our future and the future of our children. 
Also, for climate mitigation, we have to know what will happen, where it will happen. But also on a personal level, understanding our Earth and climate system helps us taking decisions. For example, if I want to build a house, it would be very beneficial to know what conditions, what climatic conditions will be there. Will it be hot and sunny or will it be wet and cold? This will then lead to me deciding how to build the house. But another reason is climate protection. In the 1980s, we understood that chemical CFCs harm our life-protecting ozone layer in the stratosphere. So banning the production of these chemicals helped all of us. But how can we gain this valuable understanding of our Earth and climate systems? There are three fundamental ways to advance our understanding of the Earth and climate uh, systems. So, one, we can conduct simplified experiments in the laboratory. Two, we can observe parts of these complex systems directly. And three, we can simulate these systems in a theoretical way by building climate and Earth system models. One example for an experiment in the lab I want to mention is our work on new greenhouse gases, CO2 and water vapor, are well-known greenhouse gases. However, there are dozens of other uh, greenhouse gases, gases present in the atmosphere, most of them man-made. Their number is ever increasing, so we are always on the lookout for new ones. We need to be able to estimate the effect of greenhouse gases on global warming, which is why we run experiments. The way greenhouse gases work is that they trap infrared radiation, so that's heat, and therefore prevent it from leaving our atmosphere. So we took a sample of one of our new gases and exposed it to different types of heat radiation, and it looked like this. The gas trapped some of the heat radiation quite well, those are the spikes, and after some calculations, we arrived at a number, 3,300. This gas is 3,300 more times more efficient than CO2 in trapping heat radiation. Its concentration in the atmosphere is increasing but luckily is still tiny. We still need to keep an eye on this one, as it has the potential to become a serious threat. And a double threat too, as it is a CFC, so it also destroys the ozone high up in the stratosphere. As you already know, one of the things that interests me most is the state of this ozone layer in the stratosphere. To understand what is happening, we have to get to the stratosphere, and this is a bit tricky, as the stratosphere extends from about 10 kilometers above us to about 50 kilometers. Passenger aircraft can usually get to about 13 kilometers, and special research aircraft make it to about 20 kilometers. So the best way of getting higher up is to use balloons. In the past, scientists have used large research balloons that can lift gondolas of several hundred kilograms and contain huge amounts of helium. This is, however, very expensive, and it's also very dangerous to land such a gondola in any populated region. Imagine a massive metal construction with strange-looking humming and flashing devices descending into your back garden. Luckily, instruments to obtain precise measurements of atmospheric parameters have become smaller and smaller. This is why we now have a sensor package that weighs just about four kilograms, and we send it to the stratosphere from our institute backyard with a much smaller balloon, essentially a weather balloon. A biggish weather balloon, but still a weather balloon much smaller and much cheaper too. It looks like this. Or, if you're lucky, can look like this. In the first picture, you can see one of our main sensors, which is called an air core. It essentially is a long piece of tubing that is open on one end, so it empties on the way up as pressure decreases with increasing altitude, and then it fills on the way back down, therefore collecting air from around 30 kilometers to the ground. And here's one example of how the data looks like. What you see is the concentration of one important CFC and how it changes over time near the ground in blue and all other colors are results from between 10 and 35 kilometers. The lower the concentration, the deeper we got into the stratosphere. What you also see is that the passenger aircraft in black doesn't really get there. However, the research aircraft in red and the weather balloons in orange do. 
And since we started launching those weather balloons in 2016, we are gathering a lot more data from the stratosphere and with a lot less effort and money. My final point is that, of course, you cannot get the same amount of information from the small weather balloons that as you can get from research aircraft and large balloon flights. So it is also very important to carry out these other flights and fly more, more and heavier scientific instruments. Luckily, we did one of these rare, large and somewhat dangerous balloon flights in northern Sweden this summer, and I did bring along a video from the launch to show you. Perhaps you spotted the blue light flashing, which is our instrument from Jülich. The flight went very well, and we now have some exciting results to work on. As Johannes said, there's a third way to gain a deeper understanding of our, of our Earth and climate systems. It's by building models and running them on a computer. Numerical modeling has a half-century-old tradition. It started with very simple algorithms. And thanks to observations and experiments, we increased our understanding of the systems and included more and more interactions and processes into these models. Nowadays, we have highly complex numerical models based on mathematical formulas. But still, the world is not fully understood. A novel approach to improve our understanding of Earth and climate system is by using artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, in short AI, can ex explore empirical relationships between various forms of observational data and the Earth system. By empirical relationship, I mean that we do not have a mathematical equation. For example, we can train our AI to predict the air quality based on environmental characteristics. So there is not a known chemical uh, relationship for the relationship between land use, population density, altitude, and the air quality. But intuitively, we as humans, we know that if we are in a highly populated area, highly industrialized, we might have a poor air quality. AI has no intuition, but in contrast to us humans, AI is able to find this unknown formula connecting the environmental characteristics and air pollution. So, with help of AI, we can combine data describing the environment with air quality observations around the globe. But how does this actually work? So, we teach our artificial intelligence by giving it thousands of examples. With example, I mean we have a pair of data describing the environment and the corresponding air pollution observation. Imagine it like this the station, is located, or we are surrounded by a high population and mountains, we are in the sunny south, and we have a corresponding air quality observation. This is only one example. We have thousands of examples around the world, 
and we present these examples hundreds of times to our AI. So finally, our AI figures out the empirical relationship between the environmental characteristics and the air quality. So an AI which already learned the relationship is a model. We can input environmental characteristics to this model and get an air quality estimate. And this approach is quite different from what I've told you before with the numerical modeling. For numerical air quality modeling, you need to know atmospheric chemistry and physics. You have to define the chemical model while writing down the chemical equations. And this chemical model then takes in atmospheric variables and gives us a prediction. But in contrast, AI figures out that for us. So now that we have this model by our AI, what can we actually do with it? So first, we can feed in data from areas where we do not have any air quality observations. Here you can see how our AI predicts the air quality in regions without any observations. This air quality estimate in itself is already very valuable for the people who live there, for their agriculture, and also for their decision making. But as I said, we want to base our decisions on our AI predictions. For, therefore, we have to make sure our AI is reliable and that we trust it. As you can see on this map, we only colored areas where we are certain that our AI is doing a good prediction, or we can, be, uh, we can explain that prediction. So explaining AI is actually a pretty new research field. It's all about figuring out how the AI does its predictions. Concretely, how does our AI connect the environmental characteristics to the air quality? And the answer is, it depends on the type of AI. So for the sake of time, I will only talk about uh, one AI called random forest. The random forest consists of decision trees. Each decision tree predicts the air quality giving the environmental characteristics. Each prediction is slightly different. And finally, we hand in all the predictions of the single decision trees, average, and this is the prediction of the random forest. So studying uh, the trained random forest gives us actually insights into how the AI works, how it does its predictions. Here you can see a visualization of explaining a specific air quality prediction with our, random, our trained random forest. It also helps us to further analyze our air quality observations from an AI perspective. Using AI to explore Earth and climate data is a very promising modeling approach to gain a deeper understanding in our Earth and climate systems. So, in summary, at Forschungszentrum Mülich, we use different ways to improve our understanding of the Earth and climate. Of course, there are many more interesting examples we couldn't show today. We continue developing new and exciting experiments, observations and new modeling approaches to predict current and future changes to these complex systems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scarlett and Johannes. Thank you. Every one of us forgets something every now and then. So maybe we forget to buy milk when we are at the supermarket. Maybe I forget the name of a person I met 10 or 15 years ago. Or maybe we just forget our password to our email account. But of course, forgetting these things is not necessarily linked to a serious illness, a serious disease such as Alzheimer's or another mental disorder. Two researchers from the Institute of Neuroscience and Medicine, Brain and Behavior, they want to find out more about how our brain is organized and how the organization affects mental illnesses. In the second part of the next presentation, you will hear Dr. Kaustu Patil. He's the leader of the working group Applied Machine Learning. And Professor Dr. Sarah Genon will begin the presentation. She's the leader of the working group Cognitive Neuroinformatics.
Sarah, to put it very simply, your research is about how our brain is organized, um, how it works, and why this organization sometimes doesn't work very well, so why we forget things. What would you say, what is the most important thing you want us to keep in mind and not to forget now when we're listening to your presentation? Mm, that we are all different uh, in general, but also when it comes to medical condition. And mm. this morning I was talking with my colleague about the fact that different people show completely different symptoms of COVID. But this, is, this variability is actually something very general in medicine. And we also have it for brain disorders. That's why we want to develop tailored treatment, tailored solution in how we feel. We will hear more about that right at the start now of your presentation. Looking forward to that. It's called The Organization of Our Brain, Tracking Aging and Mental Illness with Big Data and AI. Thank you. I'm sure you have all heard about Alzheimer's disease. One usually thinks of Alzheimer's disease as soon as one gets old, one has memory difficulties, and medical exami examinations show alteration in the brain. Indeed, there is one key region which is crucial for memory, which is called the hippocampus that you see here in red and that we can find deeply in our brain. So from this point, we might think that Alzheimer's disease is a well-defined and well-known disease and that all patients show the same profile of symptoms and that they should be treated the same way. During my PhD studies, I've seen hundreds of patients with Alzheimer's disease. I, for example, have met a 60 years old nurse who had very specific memory complaints. She could not, for example, remember where she parked her car. And she was very worried about these memory troubles. But apart from this specific memory complaint, she had no other cognitive complaints. I also have met a 90 years old retired professor who also had memory complaints, but his case was not very specific. So he had other type of complaints. For example, he could not concentrate to do several tasks at the same time. And he could not make quick decision anymore. But I most significantly remember a 60 years old retired company director who called me every morning during one week. So the first day he called me and he told me, Dear Mrs. Genon, I've seen that you sent me a letter for an appointment for participating in your neuroimaging research about memory. I might agree to participate, but I don't have any memory troubles. After reminding him the context of my letter following his visit to the neurologist, he agreed to participate. But then the next day, he called me again. There, Mrs. Genon, I've seen that you have set an appointment for me for participating in your research. But I don't have any memory troubles. I might agree to participate, but really just to do you a favor. OK, so I, uh, again, we talk again together. And uh, of course, he agreed to participate. But then the next day, you can imagine what happened. And the week after, it was his wife who called me because he didn't want to try any medication because he had no cognitive problems. For him, it was his wife. She obviously had a problem. <laughs> so do you think that these three patients should be treated the same way, that they and their close relative face the same problem in their daily life? And if there is one key region for memory, how comes that we have this diversity of symptoms in the patients? To look closer at this question, we took a sample of patients with Alzheimer's disease who agreed to get an MRI scan of their brain. So this gives us a kind of high-resolution picture of the structure of their brain, but in 3D. And what we did is that we look for each location point within the hippocampus, so this dark gray elongated region that you can see deeply inside the brain. And we 
take a clustering algorithm to identify when there is gray matter lost at this location in the hippocampus. Where else is there gray matter loss that we call atrophy in the brain? And so we do that for different points. So the basic idea is that if we take these two dots, so the green dot, when there is atrophy there, where else is there atrophy in the brain? And when we see atrophy at this red, this green dot, where else do we see atrophy in the brain? And our clustering algorithm helps us to identify specific association. And what we find is that different uh, patterns of atrophy in the brain are related to atrophy of different parts of the hippocampus. So there are actually at least two different brain networks that interact with two different parts of the hippocampus. Here, the red network works with the head of the hippocampus, whereas the pattern of blue region is co-atrophied with the tail of the hippocampus. So to better understand then how these different uh, patterns relate to behavioral disorder, what we did is to compare this pattern of atrophy in the brain to the way our brain is activated when we do behavioral tasks. And what we find is that the pattern of red regions actually correspond to a network of regions that are engaged for motivation, emotion, and in general, self-related processing. So this allows us to reflect on who we are in particular. And the pattern of blue regions, in contrast, is related to processing of information from the external world. So this is important, for example, for spatial navigation, but also for learning new information. So this means that there are at least two different networks that we can see here. And depending on which network is affected and to which extent, we will observe different behavioral symptoms in the patient. Now you might think that the doctors in the clinic and the researcher, they should just look at the pattern of brain alteration to define specific prognostic and person-specific treatment. Okay, let's look together at a brain scan. This is a three-dimensional image. It means that we are supposed to look at hundreds of brain regions at the same time. We, humans, can actually do not do that. This is why we need to develop artificial intelligence techniques to identify, to process all this information and to identify the relevant information for individual prediction from this brain scan in order to develop person-specific prognostic and treatment. Now I will let my colleague, Coach Stroop, tell you more about what we are doing with this artificial technique in the brain, artificial intelligence technique in the brain. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So let's consider one very specific individual prediction problem. It's called the age prediction problem. So if, imagine you take a five-minute MRI scan, and the question is, can we find out just simply based on this MRI scan how old this person is? Now imagine we have a big database of thousands or tens of thousands of people with this high-resolution MRI scan and their age. What we can do, we can train an AI method on this. And then the question is, now there is a new person that the AI has never seen, right? We have the MRI scan for this person. How old is this person? Is it somewhere here? on this age continuum, or is it here, right? So we actually trained such a method, and here is the outcome, right? So each dot here is one person. On the x-axis is the actual age of this person, on the y-axis is the predicted age by the AI. So we see it aligns quite nicely on the diagonal, that means it's accurate. Indeed, four to five years, that's the error. But that's not the most interesting thing. What we are interested in, where the AI actually tells us that the person is, the brain looks much older than the true age of the person. For example, in this case, the person looks like almost 40 years old to the AI, but the true age is 20. 
So we can use a method like this to actually spot some kind of atrophy or early aging signs. We know from many, many studies that this is true for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, as well as for many other disorders. Next, <clears throat> we can actually open up this AI and ask the question, how the brain ages? Hmm? Where in the brain the age is actually affecting the most? As we see in this kind of rotating video, is the, the frontal parts, the, partly the cognitive parts of the brain, as well as the motor on the side, the red parts, they actually age more. Hmm? So the, there is gray matter atrophy happening in these parts of the brain. Hmm? So how? Based on MRI, are we able to tell this? Of course, we use AI, but what is MRI actually giving us? So when we put a person in the, in the MRI scanner, what we get is a 3D image, which is, consists of a lot of voxels, which is three-dimensional pixels, and hundreds of thousands of those. Right? So what we saw, the age prediction, was trained on what we call as the structural MRI. This is high-resolution MRI images. But the, as we saw already, the brain regions don't work in isolation. They work together with, with each other. To find this type of information, what we need is the video of the brain. And this is also possible with MRI. So we take many pictures, one after the other, and that tells us how different brain regions work with each other. Right? And I will show you an example how this can be used. Of course, we need machine learning methods. Um, and I will quickly try to explain why uh, they help us. So traditionally, what is done, let's say we have two groups, young and old, and we try to find where the differences are in these groups. But we already saw there are lots of inter-individual differences. If we zoom in into individuals, we start seeing many different characteristics. And this is where AI can help us, to make individual level predictions. We are not interested in so much in the groups, but actually make predictions that are specific to the individual. This is where AI can help us. The second part, is with the multivariate patterns. Here is an example. Let's consider basketball players and sumo wrestlers, right? We look at their height and their weight. If we look at them separately in isolation, any statistical method will tell you they do not look different. They are the same. We put them together, we start seeing the differences. So this is a simple example of multivariate pattern. Now, with MRI images, we have thousands of features like this, or even tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of features like this. So AI can actually help us to extract this multivariate pattern information and build predictive models based on that. And the final goal is to build generalizable models. What that means is we want to apply the model that trained on certain data to new unseen examples that the AI has never seen before. That's where the real application comes in. Because these are there are certain challenges also that are associated with that. We'll quickly have a look at them as well. So in general, Big data plus AI is perfect. It's a very good recipe to build such a generalizable models. But in some cases, especially clinical cases, we do not have big data. We have only small data. We do not have thousands of examples, but maybe hundreds at best. So what to do in these cases is actually we need to help the AI to focus on very important information. And we have developed a method for this, for example. So what you see in this matrices is what is called as the connectome. So this is what I talked about, the interaction between different brain regions. Right? So this is a whole brain picture, but this is too much for AI to handle, especially because we have small data. So what we do, we ask AI to focus on certain subset of this data. What that means is this is we build upon decades of knowledge that has been accumulated by multiple behavioral and task-based studies to find out which of the regions that might be useful in this case. And we tell AI only look at those and not to the others. So this lowers the dimensionality, right? So this helps the AI to focus on the right information, but it also helps with interpretation to actually find out which brain regions, the interaction between them is actually predicted. Here is an example. We combine this approach with machine learning, so we train AI models, again, to predict unseen examples. So that's the key, right? In this case, then we can make conclusions like the cognitive symptoms of schizophrenia can be predicted by social and affective network in the brain. Right? Then we can go even one step further and say exactly which brain regions are actually being predictive and the interaction between the brain regions. Yeah? So what I have shown you are two examples based on the structural data and the functional data in two different ways to make, build predictive models. Of course, there are many other things we can do with this, but the future is actually looking at much more different types of modalities of brain data, combine that with behavioral, physiological, 
genetic information as well as to interspecies comparison. So this is going to be the key to actually build clinically applicable individual prediction models. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kaustu Patil, ladies and gentlemen. Kaustu, you talked about big data, about machine learning, and it sounds like you need a lot of computing capacity for that, for your research, for the development. Is there enough computing capacity in Jülich, or should there be more? <laughs> Uh, so indeed, everything that I showed you, it depends on lots of computation, right? So with lots of this big data AI, and luckily we have some of the fastest and biggest supercomputers in Eulish, so that helps us a lot, but of course more is better. Always, yeah. always better. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Karsten Patil, and thank you, uh, Professor Sarah Eugenon, once again. And that's it. That was our last presentation for tonight. Thank you again to all of our researchers for these really amazing insights into your work. But before we end the event, I'd like to ask Professor Marquardt back on stage and all of the other uh, researchers, the presenters as well, please. <laughs> Professor Marquardt. How did you find it? I guess you must be pretty proud of the researchers, of the presentations, and maybe as well of the progress being made for society that we've seen here tonight? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm really excited about what I have seen. Really great results, great research, and it's, it's, it's very nice to see how passionate and enthusiastic you talk about your work in a very professional way. And I must admit, I'm also a little bit satisfied to contribute just a tiny little bit uh, as a member of the board, yeah, to work on the enablers to facilitate what we have seen tonight. But obviously, it's your great achievements we have seen tonight. And to say, <laughs> to say thank you again, we have some, some flowers that you can give away, maybe. And flowers for all of our researchers. <laughs> and the other sides. Yeah. <laughs> So, jetzt sind alle versorgt. Herzlichen Dank auch nochmal äh, ja, auf Deutsch von mir an alle Beteiligten des heutigen Abends, vor allem natürlich an unsere Vortragenden, aber auch an unsere Zuschauer und Zuschauer, thank you to our spectators zu Hause oder wo auch immer Sie gerade sind, live stream. Und live stream. Uh, so, we, we say goodbye to you now. Thank you very much for your attention, for listening. And have a nice evening. Thank you.